because uh, there's two of us, we have about an hour, and the only way we can fill this meaningfully is if you have lots of questions. And the only way we can have questions is if you guys come up front. So I know it's good to be a backbencher, but why don't you guys come up front? Yeah? So this is, none of us have slides. None of us have 18 bullet points to make. So hence, there's a chance it might be interesting. Right? Uh, so uh, my name is Mahesh, this is Duncan, and hopefully we'll talk today about China, India, startups, life, the pursuit of happiness, demonetization. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. yeah. Whatever it is that you guys want to talk about. Uh, and we're simply going to have a conversation. So what I'll do is maybe request Duncan to start off by introducing himself. And, and you know, we'll do the same and just carry on. Yeah. Thanks very much, Mahesh. So my name is Duncan Clark. I come from China. Appearances can be deceiving, but the world is complicated. Uh, I've been in China for 22 years. Uh, I went there for one year uh, in 1994 because of the telecoms opening that happened in China. But I really stayed because of the internet. And I got to meet Jack Ma in 1999, just when he had founded his company. Um, but I've seen the, really the rise of the internet in China and the rise of the private sector in China. Those two things really come together in the book that I wrote earlier this year called Alibaba, the house that Jack Ma built. But the book is really as much about Jack's peers, other internet entrepreneurs, uh, and also entrepreneurs in general in China, and how they've effectively transformed the country, including making China pretty much an almost cashless society, which I know is a very topical issue in India. But uh, Alipay and also Tencent's Tenpay means increasingly that cash is trash in India, and, uh, in China. And it seems like India's going that way too. <laughs> See, you can't stop the man. He, no matter what, he ends up talking about demonetization. I'm sure every, every, every talk does that. A quick introduction. My name is Mahesh, uh, Mahesh Murthy. I do a couple of things. I invest in startups. Uh, so I, and, and I also help market and build, large, build companies. So I helped uh, design and launch Amazon and Yahoo when I lived in the US. I've been back in India for 16, 17 years. I've been on the other side of media. So I was involved with MTV. I ran Channel V in India. But over the last 15, 17 years, I've helped uh, invest in companies like Redbus, Carvale, Chumbak, Vunik, My Dentist, Dulali, if you had to be around the corner, and so on and so forth, right? So, uh, so here we have some, I mean, somebody with lots of qualifications to talk about China, somebody with no qualifications to talk about India, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to make uh, something of it. So I'm going to really start by asking Duncan uh, to tell us about not just, you know, the extraordinary story of Alibaba, which I understand is, has a larger market cap than that of Amazon and eBay combined. But, uh, but what, what are the two, three, four, five things he's figured out about not just Alibaba's success, but that of all the amazing, enormous Chinese new internet, new era, new digital internet entrepreneurs, and that might be relevant to us? Sure. I mean, Alibaba's reach in terms of its sales is probably greater now than as you mentioned, Amazon, Mercado Libre, and eBay. Its market capitalization is around about a quarter of a trillion dollars, uh, 10 cents, similarly, in that area. So it's not yet quite overtaken the US giants. But the very fact that both Alibaba and Tencent exist now and considered to be in the global you know, inner circle of internet companies is, is a fascinating development. Um, I should have added, I mean, I've been in China 22 years. I've written this book. But I've been involved in, initially, the telecom financing and then sort of the internet financing uh, phase of China. We, we have 100 people in Beijing working for my company. Um, and we, I used to have an office in India because I, in Delhi, saw the growth about 10 years ago of the telecoms revolution in China. So it's, I think it is interesting to compare India and China, uh, but there are limits to the comparisons in that, um, many different cultural aspects and so on. But one thing that both countries share, and frankly the, the world shares, is this quest for innovation, quest for disruption uh, from a, a younger generation that is not accepting um, the incumbents. Now, the incumbents in China were very much state companies. So if you boil Alibaba's story down to one thing, it would be a, what Jack Ma describes as a triangle, an iron triangle. Alibaba's success has been bringing together e-commerce, logistics, and payment finance. Those three things have anchored their success. And in each of those areas, in e-commerce, the existing retailers at the beginning, certainly when I moved there, were state companies, very inefficient, very unattractive. Uh, similarly, with logistics, actually, a whole network of courier companies have been created to su support Alibaba. And even the Chinese Postal Service, over 60% of the mail the packages in China are delivering packages for Alibaba. So they've really disrupted that. And now, really, finance, which we were just joking about, but Alipay and some other things, they've really shown to Chinese consumers that state banks are not everything. I mean, they offer 
private companies now offer higher rates of interest, more innovative services. So if you think about it, you know, entrepreneurs have to sense opportunity. In China, the biggest opportunity has come from the state. Now in India, obviously, we have very established, very successful private businesses, uh, some of which are involved in some interesting dramas at the moment. But <laughs> the fact is there is not an obvious, easy, um, inefficient dis uh, sector to disrupt across the board. In, in China, we have that with the state. So I think there's a, there's a massive difference uh, uh, between uh, India and China. And a lot of analysts seem to put India into this BRICS map, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China, South, South Africa. Basically under the theory that whatever works in the US is something you can take copy-paste in Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So this was really interestingly applied to the internet sector. So for instance, if you take Google, well, the Google of the US is Google. Uh, the Google of Russia is Yandex. The Google of China is Baidu. And then somebody funded a company called Guruji in India to become the Google of India. If I take Facebook, the, uh, the Facebook of US is Facebook. The Facebook of Russia is a company called VContact. The Facebook of China is a company called Renren. And then somebody funded a company called Minglebox to be the Facebook of India. If I take Twitter, the Twitter of US is Twitter. The Twitter of China is Weibo. And you know people try to fund the Twitter of India. But interestingly enough, where we've landed up and why we don't follow the BRICS theory that the analysts have believed is that Actually, if you look at it today, the Google of India is Google. The Facebook of India is Facebook. The Twitter of India is Twitter. And I believe that the Uber of India will be Uber and not Ola. And the Amazon of India will be Amazon and not Flipkart. For a, for a very specific reason, for two reasons specifically. Why India, I believe, will not be like China, though I could be wrong, is because in China and Russia, there's lots of state government norms and restrictions on US companies coming into China. Google isn't really allowed in, Facebook isn't allowed in. I mean, I think Zuckerberg is going and kissing some, you know, Politburo or, you know, uh, backsides to try to get Facebook into China. But India has no restrictions, so Facebook is open in India and, you know. So a lot of people who came into India with a lot of money, I mean, Facebook raised three, three and a half billion dollars, and, you know, is now valued at just maybe five billion dollars. So essentially, you know, it was valued at 15, it's come down by a third. Today, I imagine, I understand at three o'clock, Masayoshi Son of SoftBank is going to make an announcement in Delhi. I believe he's going to announce that he's buying an Indian e-com company at one third the last price, at a 65% discount. Uh, you heard it from here, me first. Uh, and again, again, so most of the companies that got funded in India, uh, whether it's a Flipkart or a Shopclues or, you know, people who try to do copy-paste did not work in India, while people who tried to do copy-paste or whatever in, in China worked extraordinarily well because the government stopped anybody else from coming. Is that true, not true? You know, that question is one that kind of haunts uh, the in incumbent now internet companies in China. For example, Baidu. If you visit Baidu in Beijing, the first thing they'll show you on their tour is a patent which their founder, Robin Lee, had filed allegedly three months before the Google guys had funded the patent. So me thinks they protest too much in a sense, but the, to be fair, I mean, Google uh, was not blocked initially and still is partially available, but increasingly uh, unavailable. Other sites like Twitter has uh, uh, long been blocked. They were initially, uh, and you know, if you're not blocked, it means you're irrelevant. Once you become relevant, you're blocked. Um, YouTube, similarly. So this question does kind of gnaw, I think, at the Chinese internet entrepreneur's sort of sense of psyche and sort of uh, membership on the global inner circle. Because if it's seen that you relied you know, on government uh, support, um, then should you really be in the room sort of thing. The reason I wrote the book about Alibaba is because e-commerce ultimately is much less of a sensitive topic um, than, say, social media or news uh, or search. So in a sense, uh, you know, if I wrote the book about Baidu, um, I would immediately get into the whole psychodrama of Google in China and, and the firewall. Now, let's not be naive. I mean, Alibaba is a very large, impactful company now. It now owns newspapers, for example, the South China Morning Post, but also in China, it has a growing uh, influence in, in uh, news, also in entertainment. Alibaba Pictures, if you go uh, to see Mutant Teenage Ninja Turtles or Star Trek or others, you will see Alibaba Pictures uh, be the, pretty much the second thing you see on the screen um, because they're financing films. Uh, Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment, Alibaba just invested uh, a big chunk into that uh, company. So, but the origins of Alibaba, what I write in the book is about the, the private sector revolution, particularly in the home province of Zhejiang. Now many people know Shanghai, um, but Hangzhou, the city which recently hosted the G20, the first time 
China hosted G20. That was important symbolism because Hangzhou has never really been uh, seen as a tier one sort of city for China, but increasingly I would argue Hangzhou and also Shenzhen across the border from Hong Kong where Tencent is based and Huawei are becoming the real motors of China's innovation. And I think both in Tencent, which really is a games company, and you mentioned SoftBank, obviously they bought the Supercell business, uh, and SoftBank is an early investor in, in Alibaba as well as Yahoo and all this. So both, uh, I think Hangzhou and Shenzhen are a prism through which we can see the new China emerging, frankly, a more entrepreneurial driven, innovation driven China. The other companies, it's not to say they, they don't have innovation. Baidu is a big investor in AI, and they have a big lab in Silicon Valley, also in uh, driverless cars. But they, are, they still are seen through the lens of a company that has benefited from uh, government sort of censorship. Um, so, so I would divide them up in that sense. Cool. So one more thing, Duncan, I, I actually noticed that's a little true in India, and I, I'd like to hear from you whether that's somewhat true in China itself. I mean, traditionally, we've come from an industrial and agrarian economy where we were told when I was growing up in the 80s that, you know, competition is going to rise and many, many p players are going to compete for a top slot at the table. And, you know, if you look at pharmaceuticals in India, the largest company probably has 9% market share, next guy has 8%, next guy has 7%, and so on and so forth. But interestingly, if I take the new economy, for example, if I take instead of gasoline-powered cars where there's so many brands fighting, and if I take electric cars, there's Tesla, which is an extraordinary runaway leader, and like BMW i is maybe 150 at the size. If I take instead of soft drinks where there's so many companies fighting neck and neck, if I take energy drinks, Red Bull is a runaway leader which is four times larger than Pepsi's energy drink and Coke's energy drink combined. But more so if I take the internet economy uh, outside of China, uh, Google has like 90% of the world's searches. I bet you can't name the number two search engine in the world. Ya YouTube has 90% of the world's video platform. I bet you can't name the number two in video, right? And I imagine similar in China, there's Baidu and I don't know which is the number of Chinese search engine. It's almost just like China's a separate planet, but the same rules apply that one company goes and takes a dominant position like there's uh, uh, with the Tencent, you know, with QQ. And it's absolutely the dominant messenger. I don't know if somebody else, if there's a close number two. And is that true? Because in most of the sectors in the economy in India, it's like a winner take all. Now, once upon a time, we had, you know, five, seven companies that could hope to be contenders in India. But now you get in, one guy wins 80%. So it's almost like, is that mathematical? The first guy gets 90% of the market. The second guy gets 9% of the market. The third guy gets 0.9% of the market and so on and so forth. So we're seeing this rise of dominance in niches in India. Is there something similar in China or is, is it still free or is there a lot less, I mean, is there a scope for more companies to be truly leaders? Well, we have, uh, a few years ago, everybody was talking about BAT in China, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. And it was obvious because they were roughly, at that time, worth about the same. Uh, uh, Alibaba only recently had its IPO in 2014 when it's still the largest IPO in history. So that sort of gave it the big boost. But actually today, we really talk about Alibaba and Tencent as being the two inner companies. But you mentioned, uh, so Tencent w did become famous for something called QQ. Uh, which initially uh, was called OICQ, showing that it actually copied ICQ from Mirabilis in Israel. <laughs> but So Tencent was an early copier, I would say, um, but it disrupted itself. So QQ was of a PC client for chat. But today in China, by the way, if you go to China, you have the first thing you have to do is to download WeChat. Because literally, you cannot phone anybody, you can't text anybody, they won't care who you are. Uh, you need WeChat. WeChat is the mobile native sort of inheritor, if you will, of the QQ thing. So it showed that um, the difference being that, you know, if you win it takes all and then you just sit on it, uh, that's not possible in China. So Tencent had to innovate and actually did an amazing job with WeChat, which interestingly, it sort of brought in an external team to do that. They had some internal competition between their own team and an external team, and actually they went for the best product. So interesting um, analysis there, but also Alibaba itself, very dominant e-commerce, but now trying to transfer those uh, that early lead in that sector to other sectors like finance. So Ant Financial, which is a company based in Shanghai, which is a unit of Alibaba, a separate company, many people think will be worth more than Alibaba. So today, Ant Financial is valued about $75 billion. Um, so in a sense, to stay on top, they have to eat themselves in a way. Better cannibalize yourself than have somebody else eat you. <laughs> uh, Baidu has slipped, frankly, because yes, it is the number one in search, but what Alibaba achieved in e-commerce was really one thing, trust, building trust with consumers. The rarest commodity in China, other than fresh air, which I think is a problem in Delhi, is trust. So once you've achieved that trust, you can extend that. And so they've shown that in finance. Um, although interestingly, the last few days, they had a big scandal in China with Alipay. Alipay started to allow users, which is this default electronic wallet, which everybody has, 
they started allowing users to post pictures. And some of these pictures were ladies who were posting certain kinds of pictures. And anyway, the whole thing was a disaster. So basically, anything that touches on trust, whether it be corruption or some product issue, Jack Ma and the team will come down very, very hard on. And uh, um, Baidu, the reason that it's actually sunk from this BAT level is trust. They allowed um, medical, uh, in fact, often dodgy kind of fake cancer therapies and things like that to advertise on their platform. And there was one very high profile case of a user who ended up dying who posted a video saying how he'd spent his life savings on this, this ineffective product uh, treatment. And so actually the government has come down very hard on Baidu. The last chapter of my book is called Icon or Icarus. Jack Ma is an icon in China, partly because he defeated eBay and became kind of the Chinese in a inner circle for, for the internet. But um, there is also um, the risk that the government, you know, if they impinge too, too much in media or in health or other areas, the government will be nervous. And so the government's watching very carefully, interest in stability. So these internet players have to serve the government as well as serve their customers. So in a sense, I guess in, in China, we have that additional constituency of the government, a major player in the economy and society uh, directly through state-owned companies and through very tough potential regulation. So that, to some extent, adds an, another layer, uh, level of competition that Chinese internet companies have to come through. So I think the, 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 I think the global equivalent of BAT is what, what's called FANG nowadays, if you guys right. are on top of it. It's, it's Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. These are the four which... which and which now are, Google's called Alphabet, so it's messed yeah, up our whole... Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's, anyway, it's FANG, so uh, I guess it's FAN or whatever, right? Yeah. right. Yeah. So, uh, the, but the interesting thing is really the two things that you said, which is the really strict government oversight. We have yep. none in India whatsoever. Anybody can do pretty much anything out here. It's, I mean, in fact, I... I that can I, be a problem, right? Yeah, <laughs> or, or good. So a lot, of, I, a lot of my friends have actually kind of gone to government and said, look, why can't you shut down the walls and sh stop Amazon and Facebook from coming so we can build our own equivalents? But they said nothing doing. So it's, it's actually, in some ways, India is, and I, I call it, you know, it's like the 51st state of the US. It's yes. like about the size of California or somewhere else. Uh, so the companies that are truly successful here, like a few of the ones I've mentioned, are ones which actually grow in the cracks left by the, by the U.S. giants. That's one, right? Uh, the other thing is I, I really want to ask you, so what drives, what are the factors driving the Chinese entrepreneur to innovate? So you see that everywhere. I mean, till two years ago, the top smartphones in India were all Korean. And now suddenly everybody, I mean, I have two Xiaomi's in my pocket. Everybody has a, either a Chinese phone or a Chinese-made phone. I mean, Micro Max is Chinese made and so on and so forth. So with its hardware, software, what are the factors driving that crazy amount of innovation? Uh, is it push from the government? Is it push from the entrepreneurs? Tell us a little about the culture out there so that maybe there's somebody here who's inspired. I mean, do we take it too easy? Or what, what, what's really working for those guys there? Well, I think the white heat, if you will, of competition in China is just so intense. And I, I put a quote in the book from Bill Gates. You know, in, in China, if you're one of... Uh, a million people, you're one of 1,300 people, right? I mean, no, no big deal. Right? And, you know, you see that in entrepreneurs. There's so many entrepreneurs now. Uh, in the book, I talk about Zhejiang, where people are involved in offline activities, but now on the internet, too. You know, government is actively trying to promote innovation, also partly as a means to create jobs, actually. They're encouraging, you know, college graduates to start their own companies. There's funding out there. You know, it's always dangerous when government is coming with money, uh, bearing, you know, gifts. Uh, and so the white heat of competition it's interesting, if you look at, say, the competition between Tencent and Alibaba, increasingly it has very international uh, implications. So we see investments that they've made in companies like Snapchat or before in Lyft in Silicon Valley to sort of arm themselves in their competition previously in China with uh, Baidu. But now, of course, Alibaba and Tencent and Baidu and Apple are all investors in Didi, which is the uh, Uber has now surrendered, handed over the keys. So in, the competition in China I would describe as like a 3D chess game. So we have a domestic competition level. We also have the government level on top, but we also have how they relate to Silicon Valley. So Chinese internet companies are becoming big investors in Silicon Valley. They're not necessarily yet buying big, iconic internet companies. And I think under Trump, that's going to be unlikely that they would certainly rush to do that. But they're trying to arm themselves. It's almost like an arms race. They're buying the technology. They're making bets in Silicon Valley. They're also set setting up labs. And uh, as I mentioned, Baidu in terms of uh, self-driving cars. But Tencent, if you visit Palo Alto, there's an old uh, church, actually, uh, opposite the Whole Foods in Palo Alto. That's Tencent's office. It's quite interesting. Still has the stained glass windows. But they haven't put their penguin in the window, which is their symbol. But it's a church of communism. It, it, well, yeah, communism in China is we, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Okay, but the, it's a broad church, I guess. Uh, but there is increasingly a desire for these companies to put money into Silicon Valley, 
um, to you know, be stronger at home, as well as potentially become global disruptive companies. I should add that Alibaba's invested in Lazada in Southeast Asia, uh, and of course here in India, they've started to make investments, and I think we'll see a lot more of them. But the, the idea is to back other companies in that race, but you know, they're in a global game. Jack Ma says he wants to serve over two billion customers. You know, he, he can get a billion in China, uh, but in the next 10, 15 years, he's got a long way to go internationally. So I think uh, we're beginning to see that happening in India. Alibaba is an invest in Paytm, in fact, a lot of people actually in India complain about the fact that Narendra Modi decided to come. Again, the topic's demonetization. In a, in a Paytm ad in a company which is majority owned by the Chinese, uh, by Alibaba and others, uh, you'll hear today that the Japanese have bought a large Indian internet company. Uh, even Redbus, which I owned, I sold to a South African company, company called Naspers, oh. which is a big oh, Tencent, Tencent. A Tencent guy. And now they've been kind of merged, reverse merged into Make My Trip, so hence Make My Trip also has some kind of a foreign shareholding. So it's interesting, I mean, do you really think, uh, given that Trump is gonna stop Chinese companies from coming to the US, their next target is gonna be India and they're gonna come and buy out Indian companies? I'm not sure Trump will, will stop them. I mean, if he can get a cut of the deal, you know, I think it will yeah, be part yeah. of it. As long as he gets his cut. <laughs> the American president as broker, as well, investment banker. We'll, we'll see. I mean, I think the, the Chinese investment, as I said, has been more low profile than you would imagine. I mean, it's very, un, it's very difficult to predict when something becomes uh, controversial. For example, years ago, a Chinese company wanted to buy Maytag, which makes washing machines. And the famous ad was having, you know, the engineer was always inside because you never needed to call for service. But I guess the idea of having a Chinese engineer coming out of your laundry was, was too shocking. But it's very unpredictable. It's very emotional. The U.S. and China are like, you know, a married couple that clearly, you know, should probably break up. But they have these kids called the economy and stability, right? So um, it's going to be this whole psychodrama. And I'm, I'm a Brit who grew up, well, I'm actually half Scottish. I feel more Scottish after Brexit. But I'm, I'm basically counseling, I feel, sometimes between my American and Chinese friends. They clearly, it's just, you know, they need to have a long uh, session on the couch. But they're ultimately very, very uh, dependent on each other um, in terms of the market of China, of course, uh, but also increasing the investment coming from China uh, uh, to the US. It's not something that will easily go away. Um, but how this stuff gets regulated, it's interesting if you look at Donald Trump's particular issue with Jeff Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, um, and also kind of the business model of technology companies ultimately is more of an impact on the Trump voters, I think, than globalization. It's the technology stuff that, you know, just think of the trucking industry in the US. If that goes without drivers, that will not only affect drivers, but all the pit stops and the cafes and the hotels. And, and the Republican Party. Well, indeed, or what was the Democratic Party and the, you know, so the, the, the blue collar stuff. So I think there's a global issue about, you know, globalization clearly, but also about technology. And so how this plays out, um, you know, but the fact there's a lot of ex-Goldman bankers working for Trump, I think that, that there's going to be some deal making going on. <laughs> so I think that's cool. I think uh, one of the interesting things is, is uh, one of the challenges we have out here in India is, I think one of the good things China has is it has one script, right? It may have uh, Mandarin and Cantonese and various other dialects, which has one script. Right. Uh, if you open a currency note, you'll find 20 odd languages on it. Uh, you know, we're at 300 or 400 million internet users in India, and only 350 million of us speak English, and all of the internet is in English. So I think there's, the, the, the really interesting thing is that the companies that are truly doing a lot to break this are actually the Chinese companies. You look at a Xiaomi phone, it's there, you know, all of this stuff is available in multiple languages. So it's strange that Indian companies are not doing enough to get into language while Chinese companies are. So essentially, there's a very different nature of the market between the U.S. Uh, and India. The U.S. is a very first world internet market. And here, we're, we're still kind of largely agrarian. A lot of the country isn't connected yet. China is, what, six, 700 million internet users. Mm -hmm. We're at 400. So we're at the second largest internet base in the world. So what lessons from China, what opportunities from China in terms of connecting the vast unconnected masses do you think might exist in a country like India? Sure. Well, so uh, China is a continental economy. I mean, I think India is too, right? You can see massive differences across the country. But of course, if you look at that strip, you know, that's a map that I put on Twitter recently, it's just 50% of the uh, Chinese population is on really a very narrow strip down along the East Coast. So it's important to think about urban versus rural. There are increasingly, though, large uh, urban clusters inland in China. Of course, cities like Chengdu and Chongqing, increasingly very sophisticated, you know, direct flights all over the world, sort of, um, you know, globally very sophisticated consumers. So, it, it, you know, all generalizations are false except this one, right? I mean, it's, you know, know carefully your market. Uh, but on the other hand, um, you know, one thing that's common in China is there is this consumerism is now the only official is talked earlier about socialism and communism. Consumerism, we just saw at the 11-11 Singles Day. So Alibaba effectively uh, appropriated this holiday called Singles Day, 1-1-1-1, where you have single people buying because, you know, 
you know, most people are not in happy Valentine's Day relationships. So uh, for, the, for the rest of us or those people, they can buy uh, to their heart's content. $18 billion of goods were sold in one day, actually, uh, a month ago uh, at Alibaba's thing. So in a sense, they've tapped into that nationwide aspect for buying things. Now, what people are buying differs in different parts of the country. So actually, uh, over, I think, a third of the purchases this year were actually of foreign goods. So this underlies Alibaba's strategy and actually may help them in the US as they're actually allowing people, for example, to buy cherries from Washington State or lobsters from Canada. They just launched with uh, Justin Trudeau um, or wine from Italy. The idea is that there is this uh, middle class or even upper middle class rich uh, population in China will pay a top RMB for products. At the same time, Alibaba has a strategy called rural Taobao. So again, 600 million people are still in the countryside in China. So much as we've seen the political implications of the wealth gap in the US, uh, um, China's also worried too about that if we are having the have-nots. Um, so what they're trying to do, Alibaba effectively, you know, bowing a bit to the government is we're going to help farmers sell their products through um, setting up a network of kiosks in those areas, but also they can become consumers. Because if they don't have a, if they're not served by the post office or even by private couriers, at least they can go to the kiosk to pick up. It's, it's going to be a long haul, but Alibaba was worried if they don't actually capture that market, somebody else could actually become another Alibaba in those rural areas. So Alibaba itself is a reflection of all of those contradictions. That Alibaba is trying to be very global, international in Hollywood, but it's also in some local county town. It has to basically cover all of its bases. So one or two more questions, and uh, we're going to quickly take a lot of questions for the audience. I mean, the, the first thing is really this amazing thing. So I was one of those guys who bought a lot of stuff on 11-11, right? So, oh, good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know if you guys know, on that one day, 11th of November, the Alibaba sold more that day than the entire Indian e-commerce industry does in a year. All companies put together. They sold in one day on one, on one site, right? Uh, that's something uh, pretty ama amazing. But one of the things interesting, though, when I talk to my investors, so I also run a fund and my investors are like the government's, I mean, private you know, foundations in the US and UK and the government of UK and several European governments. A couple of years ago, they started going soft on China. I mean, they basically said, you know, we don't make money in China. The Chinese companies make money in China. And interestingly, in the last six or eight months, a large investors have started pulling out of India, like Tiger, which funded Flipkart, pulled out and so on and so forth. So uh, do you see that there's going to be a shortage of capital in China because the uh, overseas guys have kind of slowed down their funding or do you not see that as a problem? Uh, what, what's, the, what's the scene like for entrepreneurs who want to get, raise funding? Where do they get it from? I would be happy if there was a shortage of funding in China. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. It's the problem to some degree. I mean, there's been a lot of funny money or dumb money, frankly, coming in. As I mentioned, a lot of uh, venture capital firms now are actually directly set up by government. And so, you know, who's going to say no to the son of the mayor or the, you know, the niece of the, you know, so, I mean, although there is a strong anti-corruption drive in China, at the end of the day, like, uh, there is not much of a tradition in terms of governance yet. And this is very new. So there's too much money sloshing around. I'm, I'm an early stage investor myself. Um, and I've invested, one company uh, was App Annie that we created in Beijing. Um, but very quickly, actually, it was never really a China-focused business. It was tapping into Chinese engineers. And that still remains a very valid strategy. But we start to see, there's another company called Musical.ly, also out of Shanghai, whose main market is the US. But very quickly, the successful companies that are uh, looking to survive and grow uh, globally really should relocate or have most of their, their market outside. Within China itself, the big challenge is how do you compete with Alibaba, Tencent, or Baidu? Now, I, you know, a lot of people criticized Alibaba and Tencent to your earlier point about being too dominant. One thing they started to do is buy a lot of companies. So the one way they've assuaged that, and they, they are increasing an exit, rather than thinking of listing in New York or in Hong Kong uh, or even on the domestic Shenzhen or Shanghai market is we'll just sell out to Alibaba and Tencent. Um, but there's so many people trying to sell to Alibaba and Tencent that it doesn't, doesn't always work. So they're still quite controversial in that. So entrepreneurs in China today, um, yeah, we've definitely seen a private equity switch to kind of a sale mode. Of course, there are concerns about a slowing Chinese economy or excess competition. Um, so it's probably not a bad time to start looking. In maybe 6, 12, 18 months, you'll start to see uh, the cycle turn. But there's probably just too much money uh, chasing too, too few entrepreneurs. There, there are great entrepreneurs, but just so, there's just so much capital sloshing around China right now. We've seen the property bubble. We see these bubbles because of that. 
So I think we went through that about a year ago and, and, and we're on the, already on the other side, things happen a little faster out here. In some ways, we're slightly connected to the Chinese economy, but we're far more connected to the U.S. economy. And when the U.S. catches a cold, I mean, funding stops coming to Bangalore and to Bombay. So uh, what I'm going to do is actually we, we do have a little bit of time and I'd love to get a sense of uh, questions for either Duncan and I. We're going to do this simply by saying I'd like to see a show of hands from people who have questions. So you're number one, sir. Who's the next question? Can we see more show of hands? Number two. Number three is a gentleman. Any ladies out there? Number four is a gentleman in that corner. Can I see a fifth hand? You're, you're number five. Let's start with you, sir. Number one, the gentleman in white out there. Uh, if somebody can give a microphone, I'm happy to. Uh, just if you can be succinct, ask a question, either of him or me. Uh, we can. Hi. Here, you can take this. Ma'am. Yeah, we're competing with the air conditioning here. So. Yeah, yeah. Hello? Oh. Yeah, yeah, take this. Ma'am. Well, innovate. Everybody can come up on stage and ask the question. No problem. <laughs> yeah, hi, Duncan. Mahesh, that was very interesting. My question is to Duncan, as you mentioned, that there's uh, too much money chasing too less dreams. So what do you forecast is going to be the Chinese uh, penetration in India? As it is, uh, I think uh, now everybody is looking east instead of the U.S. Yeah. So, well, Amazon obviously is still very much uh, has huge ambitions in India. So, Amazon, by the way, in China is on Alibaba's website. I mean, they have their own site, but their biggest presence is actually on an Alibaba website. So, in a sense, Amazon has effectively given up on China. They have a very small percentage of the share. They are brokering the China-U.S. market to some degree. But I think on India, Jeff Bezos has said that he doesn't want to make the same mistake that he made uh, in China here in India. So that's very interesting, of course, to Alibaba, whose um, um, you know, reputation comes from outsmarting eBay and to some extent Amazon. So I think Alibaba is becoming more of an uh, arms dealer, if you will, uh, with you know, PTM and I think uh, uh, more investments coming. Of course, UC Web, the browser, and probably quite a few people in the, in the audience use UC Web. They, that's an Alibaba company. Uh, there's a lot of speculation about the next investment for Alibaba here, and we've seen a lot in the press, and I was with uh, Alibaba executives at the 1111, they said something's coming, we'll announce, we don't know when. But clearly, I think they're going to be cautious about going head to head with Amazon in a very costly sort of war, if you will. Particularly, we've seen this in China, where we saw them taking on um, Uber. So Alibaba and uh, uh, Tencent both had their own little Uber equivalents. They merged them because the competition was, was just too intense. Uh, at one point, Alibaba was giving beer to drivers in Beijing, for taxi drivers to join their service. I mean, it did actually improve driving in Beijing during that time, but I wouldn't recommend that. But we've seen uh, also things like live streaming today in China. There's just everybody's doing live streaming, uh, food delivery services. You know, the problem in China is, it's not that there aren't good ideas, but when there is a good idea, you know, 400 million people see that idea and then just go in and the subsidies just kill it. So it's been a great time to be a consumer. You know, being Scottish, I, I love free things. And they're constantly giving me free rides, free food, free beer, great. Um, but we are seeing the headache now coming in. Uh, China is beginning to realize that we need to be careful. I think they have a pretty disciplined mindset towards India as well, because they could see they could very easily get into a very expensive game here. And so I think they're looking at strategic investments. Look what they've done in Southeast Asia, where Lazada was not a very good, frankly, rocket internet property um, in Southeast Asia. But by plugging Alibaba's products in, into that, uh, you know, all these Chinese products that people are buying in Malaysia, Indonesia, I think they have a good chance of success. So I think they'll look at something similar with India, if they can add something uh, to the mix, um, but not just cash. If it's just cash and then Amazon and others are out here, plus Indian uh, backers, it could get very expensive. So I think they're going to be rather sober in their investment, despite the beer. Great. So, number two? Yeah. Who's number two? You remember the number, right? Yeah. The gentleman there? Yeah. Actually, it was, it was a lady who walked out, but I'll ask a question. Uh, in the sense, that's really entrepreneurial of you. Why did she walk out? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. What did you tell her? I was thinking of walking out after her, but yeah. <laughs> the point is, do you think uh, we are making it too easy in our country for the Amazon and the Alibaba and the others? You know, because today, these guys come in and do what they want. They have a foreign funding. And the startups which were there, like Flipkart and all, are literally stumbling. While if you go to China, you don't have such an easy road. You, you literally face a glass ceiling to say, right? You have to be very careful how you uh, get into a fight with the big one out there. 
That, that is my one point. And because the valuations will reflect in the US, they will not, re the shareholders or the people who make money out of the Indian consumers will not be Indians, right? It will be Amazon getting valued or Alibaba getting valued in those share markets. So don't you think we are being a little too anti-national by allowing anti -national. these people? Yeah. come to it. You come back to Modi, one way or the other, anti-national. Well, you know, it's, I think that's a philosophical decision the government of India has to take in, at some point in time. And I think largely the government has voted for an open economy. Unlike the Russian economy and unlike the Chinese economy, the Indian economy is open. Where, so where has it not been open? It's not been open in strategic areas where people have lobbied for it not to be open. Think about it. Why do we have FDI rules in, uh, in multi-brand retail? Nobody, I mean, we have never had a Walmart come into India. We've never had a Cav4 or any of these guys come into India because... Kishore Biani and his gang basically said, nay, nay, we, don't, we want this as a free, uh, we, want to, we want to protect this entire area. And they lobbied the government to keep them out. I think our government is one of those responsive governments which base, bases its decisions on who lobbies and makes representations. So the internet industry in India, the, copy, the copycat industry, whether it's Flipka Flipkart, Ola, etc., have never bothered to come together till about one month ago to go to the government and say, hey, create a protected market for us. But I think they started one month ago, they said, we are going to start this Indian copycat protection business, whatever else it is. Like the Chinese pirates once banded together and we want to write to pirate Louis Vuitton. The Indian, you know, uh, the copycat company start. But I think it's too little, too late, and somebody's going to throw them out, right? Finally, in the end, also what it does is maybe in India, it, it reflects in lower quality for the customer. If you are deliberately protecting an Indian copycat company. See, imagine your goods would have been much cheaper if you had allowed Wal Walmart to come in, but instead, you let a Kishore Biani do whatever he wanted, or a Reliance Fresh do whatever he wanted, and you're not able. So the uh, you're not able to really enjoy the lowest prices. So how customer or consumer unfriendly will you be? How friendly will you be with the merchant? I think that's really the balance that you need to strike. In some cases, like for example, in steel, we we put a dumping duty on Chinese steel because our steel is like you know thirty-two dollars uh, a kilo, and theirs is like twenty-one dollars a kilo, and it's fifty percent more. And somebody puts a dumping duty. That happens around the world. So there are different ways of regulating businesses, and I think that's a government call. Whether you say, well, you know, we should stop all of these guys from coming. Well, you know, uh, think about it. There's a way around it. Technically, the law doesn't allow. Amazon to run a multi-brand retail outlet in India. So what does it do? What does it, even Flipkart is not allowed because Flipkart, actually technically Flipkart is not an Indian company. It's a Singaporean company with money from Mauritius, right? There's almost no Indian money in Flipkart. There's almost no Indian money in Ola. You're calling them Indian companies, they're just companies, even today the company that will be sold at 3 p.m. has 6% Indian ownership. It's apparently an Indian company. 94% is owned by non-Indians, right? What really happens in each of these cases is somebody has come in and said, okay, I, I've come in and let me shut the door after me. It's like, you know, Trump, the immigrant from Germany saying, now that I'm in the US, let's stop all the other immigrants coming in after me because I am now a native, right? So I think we're, it's a, too lit, a little too little, a little too late. And my sense is, you know, maybe it's the right way. Maybe we have a, our entrepreneurs have an even higher bar to cross. We have to be better not just than other, each other, but better than the American companies to win in India. And it's possible. You can be better than the American companies to win in India. Yeah, to that point, I think, I often think of the PRC, the People's Republic of China, as the pragmatic Republic of China. Actually, the P stands for pragmatism. These Chinese companies, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, actually often are offshore companies are listed in the US. Most of their investment is coming from the US. Um, but to your point, this is the way, the, the greater goal here is to develop a consumer economy. So the Chinese Communist Party and the government faces a big issue right now, that the old made in China model is no longer uh, tenable um, because the exports, you know, the world cannot export enough of China's goods. We have one belt, one road in an attempt to sort of push you know, steel and other things out but also consumption. There's already a huge, you know, saturated market. I mean, it's still growing in some areas, but China has to move to the consumed in China from the made in, in China, and increasingly the designed in China. And if it's going to take foreign capital involved in that, and Alibaba's protection to some degree from the government is it's helping move that fulcrum in a way towards consumed in China. This is what Singles Day is all about. It's a celebration of consumerism, which is benefiting some foreign brands, but also Chinese brands, and just generally moving the economy away uh, there, by the way, it's not, it's not a done deal yet. There's still big issues with state-owned enterprises still dragging down the economy in many areas. Um, but I think the government is, is able to tolerate 
you know, a foreign investment in that area, as long as there's a Chinese face on it, frankly. So the actual licenses held by Alibaba and Tencent and all these things have to be held by a Chinese domestic citizen. And this has been the big challenge for companies like Google and Facebook. It's almost like Mark Zuckerberg is trying to become Chinese. His wife is, is Chinese. He's learning Chinese. But his, uh, Jack Ma's English will always be better than Mark Zuckerberg's Chinese. I can say that. Um, it's an amazing, uh, weird contortions that Facebook is putting itself through right now, saying that in the US it cannot deal with fake news. But in China, it's sort of advocating it's sort of an engine that will help. You know, and the Chinese uh, government create fake news. Yeah. So, so the whole desire of Silicon Valley companies to become successful in China is like Excalibur, the sword in the stone. They all want to be, because just think of the numbers that would add to Facebook's population. But um, in the end of the day, the Chinese companies are Chinese enough, even with all this American investment and others, to, um, to be allowed by the government. Another big question is Europe. Look at in Europe. I mean, if you think that Facebook, Google are dominant here, they're really dominant uh, in Europe. And yet, through all the attempts for the French government to have a French search engine or things like that, it's have come, come to naught. So to some extent, it's a question of scale. If they've got big in India, they've got big in Europe, uh, already it's very, very hard to dislodge. It really comes down to technology shifts. When technology shifts, uh, then we have opportunities. As we saw with WeChat, with Tencent, they were able to become very dominant in that area. So we have to look at the next technology shift. If you're an Indian entrepreneur, I think you have to somehow be ready and ahead of the game for that shift. That's the great thing about technology. There's a refresh button every few years. And be careful what you wish for. If you wish for protectionism, it comes. Uh, well, remember, we lived through 70 years of it where only five people got licenses to make pumps in India and two people got licenses to make cars in India for 40 years. It was ambassador and fear. Right? We lived through crappy times. And because those restrictions and protectionism went away, we now can drive a decent car. Right? So I think be careful what you wish for. Let's come to the who, question number three was the gentleman in green. Ma'am, can somebody get a microphone to him? You're Sakshi, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hear me? Okay. Yeah, louder. Uh, I am working on two different fields. Uh, I wanted to have your opinion on uh, directions, future directions in peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, finance, and uh, artificial intelligence. So, thank you. You want future directions in yes, peer-to-peer peer -peer uh, lending, finance, and artificial intelligence? Yeah, talking about Go being, on, Duncan, being ahead of the curve, you, you were just saying, right? Sure. Well, it's really related to the mobile revolution that we have experienced everywhere. But in China, with Alipay and Tencent, with Tenpay, um, increasingly we are getting to a cashless society. I was in Shanghai recently where I literally could not spend cash in convenience stores. It's just too much hassle for them to take. Another interesting experience the other day was I was on a phone uh, talking to a journalist about the cashless society. And I, at the end of my taxi ride, and I was trying to pay cash, he said, no, I, I can't take cash. I had to hang up my call with a journalist to actually use my app to pay. <laughs> I could have put him on hold, I suppose. But, so I think there's an embrace of um, new technology, particularly mobile technology. So the, the Taobao and Alipay app, in Ta uh, Alibaba's case, and, and WeChat, um, have made it just so much more convenient. To the point that Chinese and expats living in China, when they leave China, they miss, for example, WeChat. So if we're at lunch of seven of us in China, I can AA or go Dutch with the app. We can, and being Scottish, I'm always keen to divide up the bill. Um, but you can now do that with the app. It's just so convenient. The integration of WeChat with your daily life, whether it be travel, whether it be food, and of course the big data to the AI aspects of well coming out of that, the golden or the iron triangle that I described earlier of e-commerce, finance, and logistics. Through that triangle now, there's massive amounts of uh, data being generated. Alibaba is following Amazon with the Amazon Web Services, so the Ali Cloud Services. The data, the value of that data is now, it's actually almost, it's becoming uh, almost Orwellian at risk of having these Orwellian implications. So there's a thing called social credit. For example, if we're in this room right now and it starts to rain outside, and let's say we're a few hundred people but there's only 50 umbrellas, this is already happening in China. The people with a good enough credit score would be allowed to take the umbrellas because they're good people. We know that they would return them. The rest of us, uh, would have to somehow pay a deposit. So now, of course, that's one thing for a consumer economy, but when you get into other aspects of life, the ability, for example, to post on social media. So it's very interesting. Or, or, or who gets the kidney? Who gets the kidney? Well, I don't know about that. But yeah. There is an element of ethics are now increasingly, uh, that's going to be a big issue for, uh, for all internet companies of responsibility. Um, so I think the, the power of data, and we have it highly concentrated in China in a couple of companies like Alibaba and Tencent. So Alibaba is also a bank. Um, they have my bank, and they're trying to use facial recognition technology to open accounts. Now, the Chinese offline banks are pushing back and saying, 
uh, you know, that's not, that's, that's unsafe and so on. We have had a few P2P lending, you know, disasters in China as we've seen in the US and elsewhere. Uh, but there's also something inherently very efficient about, you know, banking through your mobile phone, lending through your mobile phone. But the, the interesting thing in China is that the internet companies know their customers much better than the banks. The state banks in China never lent to individuals. Uh, they only ever lent actually to, um, say, companies. They didn't even lend to private companies. Today, still in China, there's no such thing as a checkbook. There will never be a checkbook. Um, so, in a sense, the internet companies are filling this void. So that's probably, again, a big difference with India. We have to look at the incumbents, what they're doing, what they're not doing. In China, it was actually quite obvious that the state companies were never going to do these things. This is, this is where the internet is fill, filling the void. Another, one other quick example on finance. So Alibaba, a few years ago, launched a uh, money market fund. So the idea is you have your money in your Alipay account, much like PayPal. They said, you know, we're going to give you 2% higher rates of interest on that. Within 10 months, it became the fifth largest money market fund in the world, $120 billion for this so-called loose change account. This is not loose change, $110 billion. But it is actually small change compared to the reserves in the state banks. But they were so shocked to have the competition from these. But much as China, when it joined the WTO, was using the threat of foreign competition to drive reforms in state, I think that the government today is doing the same thing with the internet. They're telling the banks and others, be careful, if you don't reform, we are going to use the internet, we're going to create new players. And ultimately, the banks probably will uh, close ranks and figure out how to protect themselves. Um, but today, increasingly, if you travel around the world, you'll see people paying cashless, Alipay, Tenpay, in Europe, in the US, these, these 110 million Chinese shoppers, they're not using cash increasingly. So it's having a global implication. So and AI, I mean, it's early days yet, but I think uh, all three of these companies and others are making big bets, but a lot of it's being bet in Silicon Valley itself. So they're a big player in Silicon Valley, AI. So we've got time for one or two more questions. We can have them very quickly. Who's number four? Well, who's number four? Gentlemen, that quickly, if you can quickly shout out a question. We have frantic people here saying, cut it, let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we'll give us a couple of minutes and, yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? You oh, have yeah, 10 sorry. seconds to ask your question. Right. Uh, so one of the most important uh, Louder, takeaway, louder. One of the most important takeaway for me uh, from your talk was what Duncan was mentioning about trust. And uh, so my question to Mahesh regarding trust is, what kind of Indian startups do you see are acting in this space? And also, to some of the new startups, what would your advice be to build that trust and maintain that trust? And the second part of the question is to you, Duncan, it's regarding uh, the government involvement in building that trust in China, and can India learn something from the government actions in China? That's so, I think. Uh, First of all, you managed to squeeze two questions where you're supposed to do, and so I guess that's very entrepreneurial of you. So on the trust front, I can tell you, I mean, it's not really up to the company so much as much as it's mandated by the Reserve Bank of India, the, the kind of things we need to do. So the KYC, know your customer rules, are very tight. So if you've got a geo SIM card, or if you get an Aadhaar card or whatever it is, the process that you have to go through to start the verification is pretty clear. Whether it's your biometrics, your iris scan, your thumbprint scan, those are things that get in there to, f to create the first trusted identity. So Aadhaar is about the first trusted identity. Uh, your Geo SIM card, whatever they, if you've gotten one, they came to your office and did whatever it is. So various companies, Paytm does it, Geo does it, others do it. The first level is to verify who you are. The next level is again to verify, to give an aura of trust in terms of how you behave. Flipkart, <coughs> sorry, Flipkart had the lead in this seven years ago. But in the last four years, Amazon is terms, you know, kind of pulled ahead. You know that you're not, if you get a dog product on Amazon, you'll get your money back, no questions asked. But in other cases, you get products, you don't know if it's real, if it's fake, it's authentic, if it, the service comes back. So not just, your trust comes out, trust is something that everybody has to do, right? It comes from how you behave and how people talk about how you behave. So in some, one case, like I said, there's government norms on what you need to do for basic authentication, and the rest is up to your corporate standards of behavior. And so if you behave in a trustworthy manner, people will talk about it. If you don't behave in a trustworthy manner, people will talk about it and you'll die faster. I think the key point really is trust is, you know, is something you, and in China is very difficult. I've tried twice to start companies in China. In both cases, somebody jipped me out of it and I, you know, I put tail behind between my legs, I came back to India, right? And I said, okay, screw it, I'm not going there. I'm to, I'll go to Singapore, I'll go somewhere else and start comp companies somewhere else. I can't do China. Obviously this man has survived, he's been there 20 odd years, right? So at some point, you know, the environment is not necessarily trustworthy. 
but what you do to create engineer trust is what makes a difference. You want to answer the second part? Yeah, and a quick thing. You know, on being successful in China, there's two types of foreign investors in China. There's the missionaries and the merchants. The missionaries try to change China. Uh, if we look at history, they end up with spike, you know, their heads on spikes. Merchants, be a merchant. So what you want to do is back a local entrepreneur. Find the back the local entrepreneur. That's effectively the story of Alibaba versus eBay and others. The success of the local entrepreneur. And in terms of the trust aspect for the government, Rather than having licensing and say we're going to ban companies from doing all this stuff, they allow companies to do things. But if they make a mistake, you know, if these are listed companies, um, they know very much a a negative comment. We've seen this with the Chinese government about an Alibaba, rarely Tencent actually could create big problems for those companies because investors expect there to be, you know, an element of smooth road. But I, give, I want to give an example here of something that happened in China that would never ever happen in India. There's an enormously large insurance company called Fosun, right, which is like the Berkshire Hathaway, the, and the, the guy who owns it is like the Warren Buffett of China. He disappeared for two weeks, disappeared. Imagine the guy who had to come, imagine Ratan Tata disappearing. He was under government detention. He came back two weeks later and said, all is fine and carried on. That would not happen in China, but that, uh, in India, but that happens yeah, in the, China. Yeah, the term in China is to have, be invited to have tea with the government. And I'm British, I love tea, but not that kind of tea. Yeah. Uh, but he did re-emerge at his shareholder meeting in New York. I've seen him around, I've seen him recently at government meetings taking notes. He's still a billionaire, so exactly to that point. There, there is a rain, there is a leash. You know, you know the limits of your uh, maneuver. And, but the government, again, the ultimate thing is pragmatism. They know they need entrepreneurs to do this. They, they can't do all this themselves. They can't create the consumer economy. They can't transform the economy on their own but there are limits to how far you can go. Cool. Guys, we're kind of running out of time. I just want to say that Duncan's book is available out at Crossword. Commission's uh, available. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta make some money out of China. Yeah. Right? So. Buy his book, make him rich, you know, give him some no, no, dividend. No, no. Don't worry about uh, I'm, if you want to follow me, I'm at Mahesh Murthy on Twitter. He's at Duncan Clark on Twitter. That's right. thank you. And, uh, Locked in China. Thank you very much. <laughs> Guys, thank you. Bye. And thank you to the organizers. We're up and uh, you can have tea with us. Yes, not government tea. Not worry. government kind of tea. Thank you so much. <laughs>